history's greatest conflict, the Second World War saw its fair share of women taking part in, and participating in the shaping of events, from support roles at the home front, to serving on the front lines or even behind enemy lines, following are 20 things about some of the women of World War II. One of World War II's most interesting women was a Muslim princess, who was secretly inserted into German-occupied France to spy on the Nazis. One of the most remarkable women of World War II, Princess Noor Inayat Khan was born in Moscow in 1914 into an unusual family. Her father Inayat Khan was a Sufi master and Muslim noble, descended from the royal family of 18th-century Indian monarch Tipu Sultan. He earned his living as a musician and teacher of Sufism. Noor's mother, Parani Amina Begum, was born Aura Ray Baker, an American from Albuquerque, New Mexico. The couple met in New York City, but when her guardian forbade her from seeing Inayat, Noor's mother sailed to London and married him there. When Noor was still an infant, her parents left Moscow for London, where they lived during World War I, after the war they relocated to France. Growing up Noor was described as sensitive, shy, quiet and dreamy. Nothing about her indicated that one day she would secretly infiltrate into German-occupied France during World War II as a member of the Special Operations Executive, a clandestine organization tasked by Winston Churchill with setting Europe ablaze. From pacifist musician and author of children's stories, to warrior princess. Princess Noor Inayat Khan studied music at the Paris Conservatory, becoming an accomplished harpist and pianist, as well as a virtuoso on the Vina, stringed Indian musical instrument. She also studied child psychology at the Sorbonne. Noor also became an accomplished poet, wrote children's stories, was regularly featured in children's magazines, and was frequently heard on French radio. She did all that before she was 25 years old. When the Nazis overran France in 1940, Noor and her family fled to Britain, although raised a pacifist, she and her younger brother Valiat decided to set their pacifism aside to fight Nazism. In November 1940, Noor joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, WAF, as an aircraft woman second class, and began training as a wireless operator. It was mind-numbingly tedious work. So to relieve the boredom, she applied for a commission in 1941, in the hopes of getting a more interesting assignment. She would get an extremely interesting assignment. From an auxiliary outfit for women, to the special operations executive. Nor Inayat Khan's request for a more challenging assignment did not escape the attention of British intelligence, having grown up in France and being fluent in French, she was quite a catch. Nor was recruited by the French section of the special operations executive SOE, and in early 1943, was sent to receive special training as a wireless operator behind enemy lines. Other Sioux women had been sent to France before Noor, however the Muslim princess was the first of the SOE's women infiltrated into France as a wireless operator, the other women sent before her had all been couriers. Noor's job was to maintain a link between the resistance in France and the Allies in London sending and receiving messages to coordinate activities. Few men or women could have handled a job as dangerous as that of Noor Inayat Khan. Nor Inayat Khan's mission as a clandestine wireless operator in Nazi-occupied France was extremely dangerous work, it grew ever more dangerous as the war progressed, and the Germans' ability to detect transmissions rapidly improved. Clandestine wireless operators had to hide as best they could, stringing up aerials disguised as closed drying lines in attics, and tapping out messages in Morse code. They would then have to wait, sometimes for hours for a reply, or at least an acknowledgement that their message had been received. German signal vans were on constant patrol hoping to pick up and triangulate the location of clandestine transmissions, staying on air for too long risk leading the Germans straight to the wireless operator. The operators had to constantly relocate, as inconspicuously as they could, no small feat back in the days, when transmitters were bulky contraptions that filled a suitcase. In 1943 when Noor accepted her assignment the life expectancy of a clandestine wireless operator in Nazi territory was just six weeks. Infiltrating into Nazi occupied France in the dead of night. On the night of June 16 to 17, 1943, Assistant Section Officer Noor Inayat Khan, codenamed Madeleine and using the fake identity Jean Marie Renier, boarded a black painted Westland Lysander. It flew her and two other women, also Sioux agents, to a clandestine airfield in German occupied France. There they were met by French Sioux agent Henri Derricourt, who coordinated air operations between Britain and clandestine networks on the ground in France. 
Dairy Court's service with the Sioux was controversial. After the war, he was accused of having been a double agent working for the Setrahitienst, SD, the intelligence arm of the Nazi SS, and betraying Sioux agents and French resistance members to the Germans. He was tried on the charges and was acquitted, but suspicions lingered and surrounded him to his dying day. They included suspicions of having betrayed Noor Inayat Khan. Betrayed into the Nazis' clutches Assistant Section Officer Noor Inayat Khan survived for longer than the average six weeks' life expectancy of clandestine wireless operators in Nazi occupied France. She arrived in mid June 1943 and lasted for nearly four months before she was arrested by the SD on October 13, 1943. She was betrayed to the Germans either by Henri Derricourt or a female agent named Rene Gary, driven by jealousy because her love interest was attracted to Noor. Captured documents the Germans to mount a counterintelligence operation that nabbed three more Sioux agents. Nor escaped her imprisonment twice, but was recaptured. After the second attempt, she was classified as a dangerous prisoner and was kept in solitary confinement, with her hands and feet in shackles. Despite harsh conditions and harsher interrogations, Nor refused to give the Nazis anything. After ten months of cruel confinement, she was sent to Dachau concentration camp, where she was brutally beaten by an SS officer, before she was shot to death on September 13, 1944. Her last words according to an inmate who witnessed her death were Liberté. After the war, she was posthumously awarded the British George Cross and the French Croix de Guerre. The Golden Girl Who Was a World War II U.S. Marine just like the men of World War II most of whom never saw combat, most women who served in that conflict did so in ways less dramatic than those of Noor Inayat Khan, one such was Beatrix B. Arthur, the comedian, actress, and singer whose rich entertainment career spans seven decades. During that time, she became famous for her signature sitcom, roles as Maud Findlay in All in the Family and its spin-off Maud. She became even more famous as Dorothy Zabornak in The Golden Girls. A lesser-known fact about B. Arthur is that, she had been among the women who served in uniform during World War II. Before becoming famous, B. Arthur had been a World War II U.S. Marine. B. attended a girls' boarding school where she was the tallest girl in school, and was also voted wittiest girl by her classmates. She became an avid participant in drama programs and theatrical productions. Entertaining her friends with imitations of Mae West, she dreamt of a career in show business, but did not think that her parents would support her dreams. Fittingly, the tough-as-nails Dorothy Zabornak had been a tough-as-nails World War II U.S. Marine sergeant. Throughout her life, the Arthur downplayed her World War II contributions, she denied having served, and steered questioners away by pointing out that others had done far more during the war. However, the documentary record shows that she had, indeed been among the women who served during World War II. In 1943, aged 21, she enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps under her birth name, Bernice Frankel. Working as a typist and truck driver, she moved up the ranks from private to staff sergeant, before her honorable discharge in 1945. While serving in the Marines during the war, she met and married her husband Robert Arthur, whose last name she took, the marriage was short-lived, but she kept the name and became Beatrice B. Arthur. In hindsight admirers of her no-nonsense characters would probably nod their heads at how apt it is that Maud, or Dorothy Zabornak had been a U.S. Marine sergeant. Rosa Shanina walked 120 miles to attend college, before enlisting in the Red Army. In 1924 Rosa Georgievna Shanina, one of the Red Army's deadliest women, was born in a Russian village near the Arctic Circle, one of half a dozen children of a milkmaid mother and a logger father, she was determined to better herself, so at age 14, against her parents' wishes, the teenage Rosa walked about 120 miles, through the taiga to the nearest rail station. From there she caught a train to the nearest city, Arkhangelsk, so she could attend college. Rosa graduated from college in 1942, as the Soviet Union was reeling from the recent Nazi onslaught, she tried to enlist, but was repeatedly rejected. In 1943, the authorities finally relented, and allowed her to join a sniper school. That was bad news for the Nazis. One of the Red Army's Deadliest Women Rosa Shanina was assigned to a sniper platoon in the spring of 1944, and by early April, she had killed her first German. That first dead Nazi unnerved her but before long, she was knocking off Germans, with as much detachment as if they had been tin cans on a fence. 
During a five-day stretch, Rosa shot dead 13 Germans while under near-constant artillery and machine gun fire. For that feat of bravery under fire, she was decorated with the Order of Glory. By the summer of 1944 as her body count climbed, Rosa Shanina became a national heroine, with her photo featured on the front pages of Soviet newspapers. By the end of August 1944, she had killed 42 Nazis. She was killed in East Prussia in January of 1945, while trying to shield a wounded comrade with her body. By then she had been credited with 59 confirmed kills. The teenage resistance fighter who became a media sensation. In August 1944, correspondent Jack Belden of Life magazine met an interesting character when he entered the French town of Chartres, a gun-toting teenage girl who stood out from everybody around her. She was Simone Seguin, who went by the gnome de guerre Nicole Minute. Belden ended up doing a story on Simone that made her a wartime celebrity. She was about to become one of the most famous women fighters of World War II. Simone was born in 1925 into a poor peasant family near Chartres, about 55 miles from Paris, as the only girl among three brothers, she grew up knowing how to hold her own among men. In 1943 a local French resistance leader killed a collaborator in the center of Charters, then fled. Moving about the countryside, he came in contact with the then 17-year-old Simone. Impressed by her poise he recruited her into the resistance as a courier. An inspiration to all women with guns. Simone Seguin learned how to operate a submachine gun, which became her signature weapon. She was also gradually brought up to speed on the activities of the Franks to Ruhr et Partisans, a combat alliance of militant communists and French nationalists. As a courier Simone needed a bicycle to get about. However, she did not have a bicycle. So her first mission was to steal one from the Germans. She did, and the liberated bicycle was repainted, and became her personal reconnaissance vehicle. The improved mobility allowed her to more easily deliver messages and stake out targets. After demonstrating that she could take care of herself and not jeopardize others in dangerous situations, Simone was allowed to take part in hazardous combat missions. They included blowing up bridges, derailing trains and killing or capturing Germans. As if to celebrate France's biggest national holiday, Simone Seguin killed two Nazis on Bastille Day 1944. On July 14, 1944, on France national holiday, Bastille Day Simone Seguin killed her first Nazi, around 5 that morning, she lay in ambush in a roadside ditch, and when two Germans pedaled by in bicycles, she fired upon them with her submachine gun, killing both. She then went on the road searched the bodies, collected their papers and weapons, and made her way alone through the woods, to deliver the hall to her resistance hideout. It came as no surprise to Simone's comrades, when she confessed to having enjoyed killing the detested occupiers, she was intensely patriotic and was inspired by her father, a decorated World War I combat veteran. When first recruited into the resistance Simone had been asked if she felt uneasy about killing Germans. Her reply was pretty straightforward, no it would please me to kill Botch. As she put it decades later it was simple, the Germans were our enemies, we were French. This teenage girl was among the women who fought to liberate Paris from the Nazis. On August 23, 1944, Simone Seguin was with the resistance fighters of the Franks to Ruhr at Partisans. When they helped liberate charters, she took part in capturing 25 Germans and shepherded them to POW cages. Simone and her comrades then linked up with the French 2nd Armored Division as it headed out to liberate Paris, and she was in the thick of the fighting that freed the French capital on August 25. For her performance Simone was promoted to lieutenant, and was awarded a Croix de Guerre. After the war she became a pediatric nurse, and in 2017, a street in curville sur ur a small town near Charters in which she now lives was named in her honor. No country has ever mobilized women for war as much as the USSR did during World War II. Rosie the Riveter is rightly praised in America, as a symbol of the contribution of women to the war effort, and as a harbinger of the growing presence of women in the workforce, however America's mobilization of women for the war was far exceeded by that of the Soviet Union, which made more extensive use of women, in its war effort than any other World War II combatant. In addition to employing women in armaments factories, and in other roles contributing to the wartime economy, the Soviets inducted women into the Red Army, not in auxiliary uniformed outfits, such as America's waves, but directly into the Soviet military. During the war, 
over a million women served in the Red Army, while most of them performed support roles, such as supply, transportation or medical care, roughly 100,000 Red Army women fought in the main battle line as snipers, tank crews, combat pilots or straightforward frontline infantry. The Soviets were initially reluctant to use women in combat. The Soviet Union grew increasingly desperate in the days and months following Operation Barbarossa, the sudden German onslaught in the summer of 1941 that came within a hair's breadth of crushing the communist state, the Soviets threw all they could lay their hands on against the invaders, in a desperate attempt to stop or at least slow down the Nazis. Yet even in those dire times the authorities were reluctant to use women in the front lines. Women were initially barred from combat, however after repeated appeals, most notably from Major Marina Raskova, who made the case directly to Stalin, permission was granted to form women into combat units. On October 8, 1941, three female aviation units were formed, commanded by Raskova. They were consolidated into the 588th Night Bomber Regiment, later renamed the 46th Thayman Guards Night Bomber Aviation Regiment. They were more commonly known as the Night Witches. Forming Women Pilots into the Night Witches Overcoming and ignoring the skepticism of naysayers, enthusiastic young Soviet women flocked to the 588th Night Bomber Regiment, many had lost family and loved ones to the Nazi invaders, and were itching for an opportunity to exact vengeance. Until then, they had only been allowed to contribute to the war effort in support roles. However many had wanted to be and knew that they could be if given the chance, pilots and gunners. The volunteers were mostly in their early 20s, but some were as young as 17, only were the pilots in these squadrons women, but so were the ground staff and ground crews, they were determined to demonstrate that female pilots, and female aerial squadrons could make a valuable contribution, to the defense of the motherland. By June 1942, training and organization had been completed, and the Soviet female aviatrixes were ready for combat. The Soviet Union's night witches take to the air. The women of the 588th Night Bomber Regiment flew in slow, and by the standards of World War II, antiquated plywood and canvas Polikropov Po-2 biplanes, originally designed in the 1920s for flight training and crop dusting, flying such old and unmilitary machines into combat during the daytime was suicide. However, if flown at night under the cover of darkness, it was possible for the obsolescent Po-2s to sting the enemy and survive. On the night of June 28, 1942, the 588th flew its first combat sortie, a strike against a German headquarters facility, the flimsy Po-2s could not carry much only two light bombs, over a short distance. However their airfields were close to the front lines, so there was enough time to fly, bomb, return to base, reload and repeat. Sometimes pilots of the 588th flew up to 18 bombing missions during a single night. The Soviet women pilots left their mark, despite flying obsolete airplanes. Although the airplane flown by the night witches the Polikropov Po-2 was slow and obsolete, that very obsolescence came with silver linings, for one it was highly maneuverable. In the hands of a capable pilot, a Po-2 could perform jinks and dips and turns within a small radius, that the faster and more modern German airplanes sent to shoot them down, assuming they could find them in the first place at night could not match. The Po-2's slow speed also had its advantages, its maximum speed was less than the stall speed of the Messerschmitt Me Bf-109 and Falkewulf FW-190 fighters, so if one of those enemy fighters tried to slow down, enough to match the Po-2's speed, it would stall and crash. Between that the dark cloak of night, and the aforementioned maneuverability German fighters found it extremely difficult to shoot down the women of the 588th. The night witches made the most out of their obsolescent airplanes. The Polikropov Po-2 planes flown by the night witches, could only carry a light bomb load just two bombs, one under each wing, so the aviatrixes of the 588th often flew in relatively thick formations in order to make a dent. A typical mission often involved up to 40 Po-2 airplanes, each with a pilot in front and a navigator in the back. Because of weight constraints, they almost never had any ammunition with which to defend themselves if attacked. Because of their wooden canvas construction, the Po-2s did not show up on radar, and the distinctive sound of their engines was often the first warning Germans had that the raiders were near, the first planes usually went in as bait to attract the attention of German spotlights, whose illumination helped the raiders. 
they would then release flares to further illuminate the target, drop their bombs, turn around to make the short flight back to base to rearm, and fly another sortie.